All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So today I want to discuss a hypothesis by a few researchers from very, very good universities and the data that they have presented is interesting as well. But once again, it is a hypothesis. Let's start our discussion. I'm going to share you, show you the links and then we'll get into the discussion. So this is drbeen.com. There is a link in the description that offers you the best ever prices, discounted prices. You would you would love it, I think. So this is drbean.com. This is the discussion. This is MSH3 homology and potential recombination link to SARS-CoV-2 furine cleavage site. I'm going to explain it, but look at the people who are involved, the people from University of Oregon. Again, I do not know if these universities actually endorse this work or not. This is a hypo hypothesis. The evidence is decent. So let's look at it. Is some, someone from India, Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital, Switzerland, University of Padova, Padova, Italy, Michigan State University, University of South Flor Florida, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center School of Medicine. So once again, I do not know if these universities are actually uh, officially endorsing this work or not but the folks have credentials from these universities so that is excellent now in addition to this here is a diagram that is interesting and i'm already seeing that some people are just taking this diagram and discussing it in an incorrect light and that is why i wanted to discuss this here and look at it in the in the way it is meant to be this is the patent that we'll talk about this patent is was issued on february was filed on february 4 2016 researchers talk about this patent in their discussion then there are some other links as well that are supporting researches and studies for this work and the discussion that i will do so with this i'm going to go here to myself and i'm going to give you an example of what they they are saying, the researchers, again, hypothesis. So here is what they're saying. SARS-CoV-2 is very similar or the most similar to a coronavirus, another coronavirus, which comes from a bat. That coronavirus is named STGA13. Let me make sure that I am giving you the name correctly before I uh, misspeak the name. Sorry, so R-A-T-G-13, totally up, upside down, R-A-T-G-13. So I remember it from rat G-13, clearly I didn't remember it. So R-A-T-G-13 is a coronavirus from a bat. It is about 92 or 93%, 96.2% similar to SARS-CoV-2. So, of course, there are dissimilarities as well. And I'm holding this to explain what those dissimilarities are. So, what happens is that genetic material is made up of nucleotides or bases or base pairs. Imagine those as the smallest bricks in the genetic material. And here on this one, every one of these dots is one nucleotide or a brick. Three of the nucleotides together, three of them together, make a codon. A codon codes for, a, for an amino acid. An amino acid can be thought of as a building block of a protein, the unit of a protein. So normally three of them together make the codon or a code for an amino acid. Multiple amino acids together make proteins and many, many proteins together with 3D shapes make us. Now imagine this side of my face, I'm going to put this yellow here, if I can, if you can see it. So this side of my face, this yellow one that you cannot see. All right, I'll, I'll put a blue one over here. So this side of my face is the um, RATG13 or the bad coronavirus, this side. This side of my face is, let's say, SARS-CoV-2. So they are kind of similar. 
However, they are only 96.2% similar, so there are still some differences. So what happens is it is possible that somewhere over here, there are three, one, two, three, three, one, two, three amino acids that are different compared to this side, the other side here. So that is a point, we'll call it a point mutation. One amino acid's basic structure or codon is changed. Sometimes that codon change actually changes the amino acid. Sometimes the amino acid stays the same, but the codon underneath is changed. This is called a point mutation. There are many, many point mutations between the bat virus and the SARS-CoV-2. Good. In the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, in the spike protein genes of the spike of the SARS-CoV-2, there is a sequence of 12 to 19. I'm going to put that here. Let's say here. And I cannot put 12 of, 12 of these. So just imagine that they are going to be 12. So in this sequence here, there are 12 of these changes that are all done in one sequence, all of them together. Imagine these are 12. All of them together. So there are other changes, there are other mutations between the two, but these are at most three codons or three, uh, not codons, three amino acids or bases. So three here, maybe three here, maybe three here, but three at one time, not more than that. But there is part of a spike protein where there are 12 to 19 amino acid, not amino acids, 12 to 19 nucleotides or bases that are in one sequence, in one whole unit, different from the other side. This type of sequence collection, all of them together, 12 of them, amino uh, nucleotides, all of them becoming different in one shot, at one place, is not seen generally in these variations or in these mutations. So that is the basic problem. The researchers believe, so what they did was, they looked at this sequence and they looked it up in genetic databases. And they found out that in the BLAST database, that is a database that contains genes for many, many things, they found out that this structure is proprietary to a patent for a sequence of genes that make a protein in human cells and that protein's name is MSH3. So today we are going to talk about that. MSH3 together with MSH2 and MSH6, they work to help repair the DNA. And if MSH3 is present in more in quantity, then it can disrupt the repair. So, of course, there should be a question in your mind that when this is a DNA repair protein, how about why would overexpression of it actually cause DNA damage? So, I would explain that. That is one. Secondly, I would explain the hypothesis that why do these folks think that this came from uh, some uh, accidental or deliberate? They use these words accidental or deliberate uh, addition of this uh, sequence. To the genome. So let's look at that. This is the hypothesis and they, they offer criticism of their hypothesis by themselves as well and then they try to answer those two which is the right way of doing science. So for, for all of us over here as well, if we can take this as a hypothesis and discuss it, great. If not, then probably this discussion should be left alone. So if you look at it at the end, it says, This is their conclusion. The presence in SARS-CoV-2 of a 19 nucleotide RNA sequence, this whole 12 to 19 sequence, encoding an furine cleavage site. And I'll explain all of this. At amino acid 681 of its spike protein with 100% identity to reverse complement of 
proprietary MSH3 mRNA sequence is highly unusual. That is a word they used, highly unusual. They did not say that there is a conspiracy. They did not say that the, the things have gone bad. They simply said, this is really unusual. We have not seen this kind of a thing before. Then they also said, potential explanation for this correlation should be further investigation investigated. That's their point. And they say over here, look, a criticism of this hypothesis is that the identified sequence is on the opposite strand of the open reading frame in the sequence, the patented part of the sequence. So now I'm going to explain it. The reason I brought these up first, that you can see they are calling it a hypothesis. It is a hypothesis. And this is their conclusion, nothing more, nothing less. So let's discuss. So um, the gifts of humanity continue. I do not have time to take these things off. So live with them, please, today. Imagine whenever you look at it, this is the 12 to 19 nucleotide difference between the rat G713 and SARS-CoV-2. OK, so DNA sequence in spike proteins mRNA. This DNA sequence is a, actually a patented DNA sequence. It is patented by Moderna. And here is the hypothesis. How did it end up there? The researchers believe that this cannot just accidentally end up. And this is what my face is telling you, that normally when there is a point mutation, which is part of evolution and part of a you know, mutation, that creates a tiny point mutation of three nucleotide at most. Here you're seeing 12 to 19 together at one cluster. That's a problem. Then we'll discuss how dangerous this can be. And of course, we're already seeing that spike protein or the virus itself and the spike is dangerous. It is killing people. Other coronaviruses don't do it. So of course, there is a lethality involved in here. There is no doubt and question about that. Do the ancestors of the SARS-CoV-2 have it? So if the parent of the SARS-CoV-2 if the bat virus that we are talking about, RADG13, that doesn't have it, then how come such big cluster of changes appeared all of a sudden in this virus? That is what is to be looked at. Researchers, as I said before, they are from respected universities, and uh, you can read about them separately. Here is a summary. Now, I'm going to go slowly deeper and deeper in the discussion. So the first part is just a summary. I'm going to present to you what is it that should be top of our mind with this hypothesis. What are they trying to tell us? Here is what they're saying. Number one, SARS-CoV-2 genome is about 30,000 bases or 29,000 and some bases. Base means or a nucleotide means one brick. Please keep in mind three bricks together, codon, codon makes an amino acid. There is a part here in the, in the spike protein area. Spike proteins, amino acids or nucleotides, bases, they start at the number 21,502 nucleotide and they continue till 25,269. This area is spike proteins genetic code. Inside this genetic code, which is here on my face as well, Inside this genetic code, there is an area called furin cleavage site. That is the area that is really the important part of the SARS-CoV-2. This gene and the protein as a result of this gene gives the virus the ability to infect with higher transmission, to bind with the ACE2, and then you would see later on that even it causes immune system to go mad and cause cytokine storms and even end up killing us. And that's not a news that it kills us. This area, the furin cleavage site, is 12 nucleotide long. Although this particular cluster of mutations is actually continuous till 19 nucleotides. So compared to the other side, there are 19 nucleotides in one string that are all changed, which is not only 12. 
And as I said before, what we have been discussing from the beginning of the pandemic, we've been saying that there are some bats. Those bats have coronaviruses in them. Their coronaviruses jumped into some intermediate host that may be pangolins, that may be deers, that may be ferrets, something. The, these are the coronavirus dumped in those intermediate hosts. That is why I made a box. We do not know what. That is also a curious thing for this virus. And then from that intermediate host, the virus in turn then jumped to human. And of course, it became capable of infecting a human either here or here or here or maybe somewhere else. But this is, the, this is the general story. So what we are saying is that the rat G13 is the closest parent. It is a bat virus, which is 96.2% similar to SARS-CoV-2. Now, if you look at the spike proteins produced by them, all three of them, this one, then this unknown viruses. So how do we know unknown viruses? So what they did was they did a database analysis of all SARS, not all coronaviruses, which would include any virus present in any animal that has been sequenced. So what they found was only SARS-CoV-2 has the genetic material to make this little loop on the spike protein, this loop is the furin cleavage site. This is the loop that is the character for today, in addition to the MSH3, which I'll discuss later on. And the researchers say, and this is not just one researcher or the researchers of this study, this is another research here. Then there is more research here, the polybasic insert. There are tons of researches about, this is not the one, this is another research, then there is more research, then there is more research. There are tons of researches that actually discuss this part of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and its role in lethality, transmissibility, binding to ACE2, etc. This part is missing in the ancestors, this unknown ancestor or this virus from bat ancestor, this part is just plainly missing in them. This cluster that you see here on my face, it's not here. So that is an important one to keep in mind. Now, this spontaneous mutation, what does this mean? So they ran, so this all is a hypothesis, they ran database, uh, um, queries to compare the data. This is not an in vitro or in vivo study. This is a data observation and hypothesis. So what they did was they looked at the RAT G13's nucleotides and they looked at the SARS-CoV-2's nucleotide and their sequences and slow, you know that there have been mutations. So they kind of looked at their mutations. And they said, this is the word they used. They said, there is a spontaneous mutation from the rat G13 or the bat coronavirus to the SARS-CoV-2 in this area. Other mutations, you could follow them. Here is one mutation, let's say. Then there is another mutation, another mutation. You could follow those. But this mutation, big mutation, all at once, all together, they just appeared. It didn't happen that there was some mutation here for three and then another three changed here in the next variant and another three changed here for the next variant and slowly they kept building up. That didn't happen. It just, they just all showed up. And interestingly, this mutation 12 to 19 nucleotide that they saw, especially 12 of them, they also encode a protein in our body, human body called MSH3. This gene sequence is patented by a company. Not only just that, this sequence is patented with human optimized codons. What does that mean? That means, let's say, all of us have MSH3 in our cells. However, when a company wants to use it, it is going to try to stabilize it. You may have heard this for the 
uh, spike protein genes as well that we use in the vaccines that we would stabilize the genetic material by using certain kind of uh, nucleotides in them. Sometimes we use certain kind of nucleotide to provide fake raw material as an antiviral. So it is common to change the nucleotides and keep these molecules as close to the original nucleotide, but change it slightly to stabilize it. That is called optimized nucleotide. These nucleotides are human optimized. These codons are human optimized. That means the structure in them, the sequences of those are human optimized. And those are exactly human optimized sequences present in the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Not a natural MSH3 gene, but the modified human optimized codon present in this little patent is showing up in the SARS-CoV-2. So that is also very interesting. Now the question is, why is this MSH3 good or bad? So first let's talk about the furin cleavage site that showed up in SARS-CoV-2 and was not present in its parents. What's so bad about that? Well, here is what's bad about that. In animal models, this mutation or presence of this mutation causes severe disease. It is enhanced infectivity in the presence of the furin cleavage site, that little rope, uh, many literature, they call it a little loop, which is, you know that TMPRSS2 would cut this, and when that would be cut, that will cut it, then we will have a separation of S1 and S2, that would then prime the S2 to attack the cell and fuse with it, right? So that all starts from here. Although Omicron doesn't care for this that much, Omicron can enter a cell through endocytosis as well. So Omicron has even greater capability and maybe little lesser capability on this side, which may be a good news. So back here, enhanced infectivity, absence of mutation. If you remove this mutation, then those SARS-CoV-2 become a little attenuated. They become milder. They don't do that much of a problem. We can actually see that with Omicron. Omicron has a problem with the furin cleavage site, and that in turn is making it a tiny bit milder. Vital for human and ferret transmission. So they said if this is not present, this particular uh, set of uh, genetic material and the resulting loop of furin cleavage site, if that is not present in humans and ferrets, transmission is blocked. And then viral tropism to human cells, that is just, I think, pushing it. What they're saying is, this is showing that virus is taking over or taking human genetic material. So from their hypothesis and from their observation and from the data, they're correct in saying, hey, this virus has picked up a human piece of genetic material. That is correct. So they, what they're saying is correct. The outcome is not much use. Although I'll show you that MSH3's presence on this virus actually can cause lots of damage to our cells, including cancers. So this is one. Now the question is MSH3. What is the role of that protein? Now think about it before we go into the discussion of this. Virus on its spike protein ma genetic material has MSH3 sequence on it. Do you know something interesting before I continue? Novavax will not have this problem because Novavax doesn't have genetic material. It only has the spike protein itself. Virus itself has a problem. SARS-CoV-2, Delta especially, Omicron is little less. And some vaccines may have this problem as well. But the Novavax should not have this problem. Anyways, back here. Imagine this. Now think about it that I have this sequence on me. I'm a virus. I enter the cell. I make more viruses. Will I not rep replicate or duplicate or make more of these sequences? Of course, as I make more of copies of messenger RNA of my brains to give them to my daughters, I will make more of these sequences as well. When these sequences are present, we have done this discussion in the past that are uh, the cellular machinery is going to pick up this messenger RNA 
and use that to create proteins, which are virus enzymes. But here is a sequence that would make human enzyme, MSH3. So if a cell has tons of viruses, then it would make tons of MSH3. Our cell may not need that much of MSH3. But now we have an overexpression of MSH3. The question is, is that bad or good? What's, what's up with that? So let's see. So imagine we have a cell. This is a cell. In this cell, this is DNA. And then around that is the cytoplasm and the cell membrane. So this is happening inside the DNA. This is a piece of DNA. And it is open. So it, ideally it was something like this and then this. And so this was the DNA. I have just focused in one part. In this one part, a part of the DNA is damaged. Now, it can be damaged when this new cell is made. For example, let's say B cell or T cell or macrophage or some other immune system cell is being made. And during the making of the cell, the cell can have damaged DNA, no problem. Cell will not finish its replication until it can fix that DNA. And if it cannot fix it, then the cell dies. So this is not uh, scary. This is normal process. When we are lying under the sun, for example, on a beach, there is going to be DNA damage as well and we will repair it and if we cannot repair it, it will kill those cells and that would cause rashes and everything on our skin. Here imagine some cells were dividing or some cells had DNA damage. Now what our body does is it has many many mechanisms to repair the DNA. The mechanism that is interesting now is the following. That is this. There is a protein called MSH2. MSH2. There is another protein called MSH6. And of course, we're talking about a protein called MSH3. Now, pay attention for a second. You, you love this one. MSH3 and MSH2, they combine together, let's say three and two, and they make a complex. Imagine they make a crane or a repair man by assembling these two units together. Similarly, MSH2 and MSH6 can also combine together. So 2 and 6 can also combine together to make another repairman. These both complexes, we call them complexes because multiple proteins come together and make a unit complex. These both complexes can be used to repair the DNA. Now, if you increase, so let's, let's go back for a second. Imagine there is a cell being produced and the DNA is damaged. Because the DNA is damaged, that cell is making a lots of MS2 and MSH6 complexes to repair the DNA. Here comes the virus. Virus comes in and starts making its daughters. And part of making daughters is to make more genome. When it makes more genome, the genome has all those sequences for MSH3. When they get expressed, they will make a lot of MSH3. Our cell didn't want all that. So what happens is these MSH3, which are abnormally present now, overexpressed now, they are going to start combining with MSH2. When they start combining with MSH2, they would steal the MSH2 from the complexes that were already made for repair. That would make this little MSH6 to become kind of lonely. Its two is pulled away from it. The problem is it is too scared now, this MSH6. Why? Because our cell has a behavior that if some couple, here the couple was two and six, if a couple becomes divorced, it would kill the individuals. So as soon as two is stolen away by three, six is now isolated. Its partner has been stolen away. The cell would kill six. Now the problem is to make more repair complexes, we need six as well. Two is already bound to three. 
three is kind of a fake material. It is a human optimized codon, which really is not the right codons. And so it cannot really do the correct work or it cannot do the work of six and two's complex. It's a different kind of a repairing system. But all of a sudden, six and two's complex cannot be formed because two's have been stolen away and six are unknown and they were degraded. They were killed. We can't repair this cell anymore. And all of a sudden, we have a problem in our DNA. That is the issue. If the issue was only that cell, ha the virus has stolen this sequence that is on my face over here, that sequence of uh, furin cleavage site is also like MSH3, so what? But this outcome where overexpression of MSH3 causes reduction in the production of repair system, that is the problem. Okay, so continuing. What we saw here is increase in chances of DNA damage to stay damaged or redu reduced repair and increased lethality of the virus. Now the question for the researchers was, fine, we have found a piece of a sequence that is also a sequence for human in the human DNA to make the MSH3 protein. The question now is, how did it end up? Of course, how did it end up in the virus? Of course, one simple innocent answer is, well, it was always in the viruses. It's just a coincidence, just like you have, a, you have two documents and the word and would appear in both of them. So you say, wow, that is a conspiracy here. No, it is just part of both the documents. So here we could say this particular sequence is part of human DNA and is part of virus, so what? The problem is that other coronaviruses do not have this exact sequence. So then you would come back and you say, you know what, so what? We have mutations in this virus. That is why it has them. And once again, the problem is you have spot mutations, three here, three there, three there, but not 12 together, never seen them, or 19 together. Then, how could we do that? There is another way, and that is when the virus enters our cell and it is replicating in there, and imagine our cell at that time is also producing MSH3 RNA to create the repair complexes, Maybe at that time, virus stole a piece of that RNA. But the question, the problem is, we usually do not have so much expression of MSH3 that the virus can steal it and make it part of its own genome. So then it may be accidental acquisition of the cell. So now imagine there are a bunch of cells that are sitting somewhere and they have, they're filled with MSH3 by, let's say, some lab experiment. Let's say an experiment for cancers. Because MSH3 is related to cancer or DNA repair, let's say there is a lab and there is this patented uh, sequence and that sequence is sent over. Let's say you and I have a lab together and somebody reached out and said, hey guys, you do this molecular biology thing. Uh, we have this little patented protein. We want to see if you make a cell defective and then you put this protein in it, what kind of a result will come? Or if the protein is defective, what would happen to the cell? So can you please do that research for us and give us the results? And we say, okay, fine, give us this many millions of dollars and we'll do this research and get back to you. That's fine, it happens. That's what these companies do. Imagine in that lab, if by accident, this SARS-CoV-2 was present with those cells as well. And it entered this cell, which was being researched upon, and the cell had an overexpression of MSH3 and the genetic material of that, and the virus picked it up. Now, the researchers also use the word deliberate. Again, they use the word deliberate. They say accidental or deliberate. And they say, we do not know what it is. It needs to be investigated. So let's see. What are those possibilities with my drawings? So before we go there, if you just wanted to say, all right, I'm done, I want to finish here. Conclusion, highly unusual that 100% match of human optimized codon sequences in a patent also present in a genome.
viral genome. Spike mutation should be investigated. This is what they are saying. Now, spike, this mutation in the spike and MSH3's presence can cause more severe disease. Why? Because MSH3 is related to the DNA repair. If the DNA repair is not able to be done correctly, the cell would release more cytokines and chemokines. Cell might even end up dying. That would create even more mess in that area and that would cause immune system to react badly. So that can cause severe disease. Number two, the recovery can become prolonged. Why? Because the cells are not able to repair fast enough because there is this stalling of the cell repair. And number three, cancers might start occurring if the DNA repair cannot be done and the cell continues to live on as well. Normally when the DNA repair cannot be done, the cell commits suicide or it does apoptosis and dies. But we saw that SARS-CoV-2 can also turn off the genes for caspases, which are responsible for apoptotic pathway or the uh, cell death pathway. And so now the cell has become a little bit immortal, not immortal, but it would not die very soon. And it has a damaged DNA that can have a possibility of uh, cancers. Okay, so this is it. <laughs> it's a long summary, 36 minutes. Details, very quick for, for those who are medical professionals or uh, general public who want to understand what exactly have they found. Here is what they found. This is the spike protein genome. In that genome, in the spike proteins part, they saw at the furin cleavage site, they saw this genome sequence. In this sequence, this is interesting, CGG, CGG. They say we don't see them very often together, and we don't see these, these four together at all in other coronaviruses. And this is the three prime end, and this is the complementary side. The, when the virus is replicating, it makes a copy, the original copy of the RNA, then it makes a mirror image of that, then it makes copies from that mirror image. So this is the original, this is the mirror image, and then originals will be made again. So simply genetic material for the spike protein has this area. Now, why is this interesting? This area in the spike protein, this sequence in the spike protein is also in the patent. So you might look at this and say, they don't look too similar to each other. Dr. Mabin, you are just not telling us the right thing here. Well, the thing is this, if you take them to the codon levels, and if you compare them, the amino acids, they are going to make PRRA. Codons, the nucleotide can be different, still making the same codon. And to give you the proof for that, if you go here, this is the codon chart. So if you can see, for example, phenylalanine is actually uh, coded by UUU and UUC. Leucine amino acid is coded by one, two, three, four, five, six type of nucleotide uh, sequences. So multiple nucleotide sequences can give rise to the same amino acid. So these slight changes in them may not be interesting what you would do is you'll go to the map of the amino acids, hold on, when you see the amino acid, you'll see PRRA. PRRA is MSH3 protein sequence as well. And here is where the sequence is present on the spike protein. Here is where the sequence is present in the patented sequences of genetic material. Then, Question, can that codon, so now we're not talking about all of it, but one part, CGG, they said, okay, fine, the whole big sequence is not found everywhere. Maybe a tiny part of it we can see in the viruses. So they looked at CGG codon sequences and tried to find them in other coronaviruses. And what they found was in pangolin virus, which we thought that the SARS-CoV-2 actually jumped from bat to pangolin, pangolin to us. Pangolin had zero. It didn't have any of that. Bat, RATG13, had 0.08%. Very tiny, very rare. Then SARS-CoV has 0.19, MERS-CoV has 0.25, and SARS-CoV-2 has 0.299. 
This is again not the whole sequence of 12 or 19. This is just one tiny part of that. That some rare frequency of that is still seen in some other SARS-CoV-2s, not SARS-CoV-2s, other coronaviruses. But one whole 12 or 19 unit is not seen in any of these. So then third time repeating, how can this happen? This is the RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is the enzyme of the virus. We know that when the virus would arrive in our cells, it will take its own original brain that was in it. We'll call it template RNA strand. It would take that, it would make this messenger, sorry, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase enzyme. That enzyme in turn will pick up the original brain and start making copies of it. The nascent brain is the new copy. Why is it making new copies? Because it's going to make new daughters. And when the daughters are built, every daughter needs the RNA. So we have to make copies of the RNA. And as I said before, from the original template, we'll make a mirror copy. Then we'll make the mirror of the mirror, making the original again. So when this RDRP is working, this RDRP can be moody. It can behave differently in various situations. One, it can totally abort the function. It can just, this is like somebody who cooks half the meal and just leaves and goes away and says, not cooking the rest. This is it, whatever it is. So that, in that case, the whole thing that whatever is made is useless. Or it can take, this is the most important one, this RDRP that is making copies of the original template brain can sometimes decide to remove that brain. This is like if you're cooking with a recipe and all of a sudden, without following the whole recipe, you decide to just flip to another page or go to another recipe book and just pick up some page from the other recipe book and start using that further. This is what it can do. So it, what it does is, it can pick up non-homologous RNA. Non-homologous means not of the same species. So in the case of virus, the other species may be other viruses in the same cell or human cells RNAs. So RNAs are scattered in our cells all the time. They're doing their function. They're making, they're helping make proteins. So it can accidentally pick up another human RNA and then transcribe a part of human RNA gene into viral copy of the gene. This is one possibility for the virus to pick up MSH3 from human genome. The problem is human genome does not offer so much of the MSH3 all the time for the virus to make this error and pick them up. Unless you overexpress them, unless you just fill the virus, the cell with the lots of human messenger RNAs for MSH3. That virus will have to pick up one of those because they're just so abundantly present. And how can that happen? According to the authors, this may be the research setting where there is a cell where overexpression of MSH3 is being done by design to do some cancer research. And virus fell on that cell and just picked up this MSH3 from there. That's one possibility. For the completion sake, here are some other uh, outcomes as well. For example, RDRP can decide to use the same recipe book and same recipe page, but just skip to another line. That would be homolo homologous, but different position. Then RDRP can also do homologous and same position. It can detach from the recipe book. That's like you closing the recipe book, then opening up, and then going back to the same exact place where you were cooking from and just continue to cook. There was just a little tiny tantrum in the middle. So that is what it can do. Then it can also pick up the original template. Homo homologous means copy of the same species, but different template. It can also pick up the original template, go to a different place, go to a different, flip to a different page and use that too. There are many possibilities, but the only one that may make sense is this and even for this one, to pick up human sequence, you have to fill the cell with those human sequences that you are hoping the virus to pick up. Or you 
deliberately add them. So mutations in the hosts, we, I just showed you how RDRP can do it. Now, can the viruses do its own mutations? Yes, let's say it's in the pangolin and it can continue to mutate there, or it is in the bat and it mut mutates there, or it is in a human who is immunocompromised and it is mutating there and making more and more variants. And some of that variant might end up accidentally producing this, although this is not seen so far. So these are all various possibilities. And then this is another possibility that somewhere in a lab, there are cells that are being used in cancer research. They have a lot of MSH3 in them, and they were just being used for cancer research. And maybe accidentally SARS-CoV-2 fell on them and transfected, or maybe it was transfected. And when that SARS-CoV-2 entered the cell, it picked up those genetic materials that were overexpressed in the cell and all of a sudden, we have a SARS-CoV-2 with this furine cleavage site mutation. Or the most crazy theory will be some crazy scientist sits down and actually adds these pieces to the genetic material. Now, this would be crazy because being able to change the genetic material of a virus or a bacteria or something and then hoping that it would survive. You change the genetic material of human cell, cell would die. Similarly, this is equal to, you know, somebody, a baby without heart born or without brain. So same way, adding genetic material may not necessarily mean adding, removing, modifying. It may not mean that exact same good outcome will happen or intended outcome would happen. It might just fail. So. The link to the patent in his notes is broken. Man, you can just <laughs> look it up. So let me let me show you how I looked it up. What I did was the following. I went, so first let me just put that link back once more. Uh, this is the link. I'm gonna put it in the description here. Now, secondly, what I did was the following. I picked up the Here, this is the sequence number, and there is a place where they have the. Oh, by the way, I didn't really believe in this part of the discussion, and that is they did their homework to say that the possibility of this happening by evolution or mutation is one in three trillion. And so there are many challenges to this homework. So I deliberately did not go to that one you could still say that possibility is really small for this to automatically happen. Uh, so going back here, this is the US patent number. It's in this paper. So you pick up this patent number, you go here to Dr. Gore Google and you say US patent number. My marker does not let me copy it sometime copy and you paste it. Once you do it, this is the patent number. If you go to this place, I found that Google patent is taking more time. So maybe people are just looking it up all the time nowadays. But uh, if you go to the one below, this one, PubChem, then it would come up. And then in here, it says US patent officer, office and Google. So if you click on the US patent office, you would then see this. So now you are <laughs> able to go and look at it. So this is the discussion. Please do me a favor, a couple of things. Number one, where is my mouse here? Number one, there are uh, there is a link in the description. That link has a amazingly discounted, almost free price for Dr. Bean. And um, it's it's, I say it every day. I talk with my team and say this price is for one video in other sites. And we have 1,000 videos. And that price is very, 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 very reasonable. Almost to the point of saying cheap. I hate to use the word cheap. I use inexpensive. So let's just call it a gift. <laughs> so that is one. Secondly, if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. 
there, there's a link to buy me a coffee, there's a link to use PayPal, or there is a link to become a patron as well. So that is the discussion. Please like, subscribe, and share. And please use this information. This is a hypothesis. When people are just going to say that, well, this is what's going to happen, or this is the reality, this is a hypothesis. Even they are saying it's a hypothesis. So let's go from there. I hope you like these dots as well. And um, should we meet for a chit chat today? Or I haven't yet created the channel. Or skip today as well and start the chit chats from tomorrow on the new channel. Let me know. And Kim says, why are the dots on your face? Kim, uh, Susan, 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 Kim. There was Kim. Why are the dots on your face? Lol. So watch the first part of the video. Thank you very much. Like, subscribe, and share. There are links in the description to support this work or buy Dr. Bean at an amazingly inexpensive price or gifting price. Bye-bye for now.